So, the triangle hypothesis. Of course, the triangle has three sides, two at the bottom and a peak at the top. Now, the peak at the top is the positive strengths of dyslexia. Now, who can doubt, having seen that performance this morning, those strengths of those kids, not only uh, in their teamwork, their listening, their confidence, uh, but in the whole presentation, the way the whole thing came together. Superlative, I thought. It made me want to cry. So, very, very impressed. Well done, everyone. So, I'm going to talk about the pattern of difficulties in dyslexia. I'm going to talk about procedural learning difficulties and delayed neural commitment the impact of stress on learning, and then introduce that triangle hypothesis and how you'd succeed with dyslexia. So, in my research, I found triple deficits. So, looking at large groups of children across the age range, I was looking to see whether they showed phonological deficits, whether they showed uh, double deficits, speed and accuracy, whether they showed uh, motor skill deficits. And I found, in fact, that 54% of my large sample of dyslexic children aged from 8 to 17 showed um, triple deficits. So 65% showed phonological deficits, 54% showed articulation deficits, um, double deficit in 81%, 62% showing speed problems, and 73% showing motor problems. So for me, I'm very much interested in the whole child, how we deal with the dyslexia, not just as a literacy problem, but as a problem that will haunt you throughout life if you don't have the right support uh, early on. Okay. So it's directly consistent with our automatization deficit hypothesis, that it's not just in the literacy the children have problems becoming expert, but in all their skills. So this is our procedural learning deficit hypothesis, published in 2007, and we were looking at how the brain works with two major systems. Sometimes they work together, sometimes they compete. Whichever one is the best goes first. So, we have declarative learning, which is facts and language-based, available to conscious thinking, and it's mind-based learning. And then we have the procedural system, and that's doing the habits, the automatic processes, the brain-based learning. And for us, we found that children who are dyslexic, and also children with SLI, DCD, and ADHD, have a specific problem in procedural learning. That means they have problem in making skills automatic through practice or just picking them up from implicit information. And that's going to lead to a developmental delay in many of their skills. By contrast, their declarative learning is intact and for many children overperforming. Think of those children who know every single dinosaur that was ever lived. Because they have those skills, they have potential strengths in the mind-based skills, including those that my colleague Rod Nicholson has talked about in Sheffield, the dyslexia decathlon of creativity, uh, big picture thinking, all of those uh, important skills that you use as, a, as an adult. So here's our delayed neural commitment hypothesis. That dyslexic individuals show a delayed neural commitment in developing the efficient networks that underline the brain basis of accomplishing routine tasks. So it's for most skills, but especially for the language based ones, and it provides a simple, principled explanation of those core deficits that we find in most dyslexic children the reading specifically, but also the writing, which is often impaired, and the spelling, which is really usually the worst of all. So it subsumes those major cognitive level theories for dyslexia, the phonological deficit, the double deficit, the visual attention deficit, the rhythm deficit, and our own automatization deficit. It's a good explanatory theory for why it is that the children have difficulties. It predicts correctly that dyslexic children will have serious difficulty in unlearning old skills. And it suggests that when we introduce the skills, they need to be introduced as part of a whole and not just broken into little bits. 
And so the point we all missed, I think, is that it highlights the rebuilding of new neural circuits. It's a key problem, in particular, it predicts a developmental delay in executive function. And executive, oops, executive function has been found to be key, particularly in the early years of learning. Thank you, Ziang. Lovely, thank you. Try to knock, knock, to knock that on the floor again. Mm. No, nope, everything's sliding off. There we are, never mind. So, it's an important insight. We need to link from theory to intervention. So, okay, it's fine having all these theories, but what do we actually do with these kids to, to improve their performance? One of the nicest things about the phonological deficit is it has a very clear link to intervention, but it's too specific. If we focus only on, that, on the phonology, then it doesn't fix the rest of the reading problems. We find that phonological support will uh, improve your phonology, but not necessarily your fluency or your comprehension. By contrast, the delayed neural uh, commitment hypothesis has a greater breadth of explanation and it provides a direct link with other comorbidities which so often occur with dyslexia and provides the rationale for a classroom readiness initiative that's proved extremely promising. Losing my breath, hang on. Do you know extra time for inhaling? <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. never mind. There we go. So, what have we got to do to be ready to read? Well, between birth and four years, we've got to get so much in place. We've got to get the sensory motor networks in place, the language networks, um, fixation, hand-eye coordination, eye-voice coordination, phonology, grapheme, phoneme, articulation, oh, a whole host, and then the learning networks that underlie them. And underneath the whole thing are those executive function skills. Uh, processing speed was important, the skill automatization, the sensory motor cognitive integration, and the visual word form area, which is the key to learning. So, what we've got here is a whole host of needs for children uh, before they actually reach school. I was particularly struck by John Everett's talk this morning, fantastic work, but really he needs them before they're five, because once they get to school and they've already got those problems, Children notice almost from the first day that they're different. So, what needs to happen for fluent reading? Automatised subskills like letters, grapheme, phoneme, and orthography, word fixation, speech internalisation, coordinate the subskills, predictive eye movements, eye voice span, the lexical lookup, that means do I know this word? Uh, vocabulary is really key. Build and rebuild those necessary neural circuits. The phonological circuit, the visual word form area for fluent reading, the circuit building, the circuit coordination, and the circuit myelination. So you build it and then you strengthen it. So, what do we need for a child to be ready to learn? Classroom readiness. It's a completely different learning challenge from natural small group active learning. The teacher talks to the whole class, explains what to do. Each child must maintain in memory the objectives without speaking while taking in the comments made by the teacher. This is a dual task, a high working memory load. Once the teacher stops talking, the child must switch from listening to doing, a case of set switching, try to prepare to do the task, maintaining all the goals in his memory. That's a working memory task, dual task, attentional control. The child also needs to be able to inhibit shouting out and asking questions, even, sorry miss, what was I supposed to do, talking to their peers and so on. It's a high demand on their inhibitory control. The topics being taught are often abstract, meaningless, they're concepts such as letters, numbers and phonemes, particularly bad in the UK at the moment. The Piagetians would argue that these stimuli are more appropriate for the later concrete operation stage, uh, particularly things like phonemes. Young children don't understand those. 
Finally, the child must do the task, which is a involves the procedural neural circuitry, maintaining their goals in working memory with the declarative circuitry, monitoring their errors, a declarative and procedural, and adjusting their plans, which are declarative, or their actions, which are procedural. It's too challenging, it's just impossible for the immature executive system. So a child needs to have so much in place before they actually get to school. So here we have the normal reading acquisition, speech and language, executive function reading, fluent reading, hooray, all is well. But what happens to our dyslexic child? Well, they're not re ready to learn to read, and they have a cloud of toxic reading failure. By the age of seven, it's very clear that they're not going to be able to do the same as the other children. So, common sense and everyday experience indicates that dyslexic children are going to suffer from low self-esteem. They're going to be more anxious about school, their parents will be justifiably anxious, and their teachers will be stressed by their lack of progress. If they seem to be bright, the teachers will think they're just lazy. The ICD-10 lists emotional problems associated with dyslexia, low self-esteem, problems in peer relationships, as common associated features of reading disabilities, and the possibility of high levels of depression and dys dysthmia, which is low-level chronic depression. And I talked yesterday about the, stress, the effects of stress on dyslexia, but I'm going to come back to the, that because it's really important. So a systematic review of studies from 2000 to 2008 showed a specific risk for dyslexic people for increased internalising anxious and depressive symptoms. And it's all exacerbated by the severity of the dyslexia, the comorbidity, particularly with ADHD, and the level of perceived social support. That's particularly critical. Parents have a strong role to play here. The DAS has a fantastic role to play here in actually supporting those children so they don't suffer. Okay. Um, okay. And female gender, apparently, is one of the factors that mostly influences the psychosocial outcomes. So girls are less likely to be diagnosed as dyslexic, so perhaps less likely to get support, but also more likely to be anxious. So bad news, really. Stress and learning. Reminder that our brain works with those two systems, the declarative and the procedural. And here we've got a sea anemone floating in the sea looking happy. But stress shifts the processes of the brain-based, action-based procedural system to fight or flight. And it reduces the blood supply for declarative le learning. So even relatively mild stress causes all of us to batten down the hatches and blights any ongoing declarative learning processes. I think I've got my sea urchin here looking really stressed and closed in on itself. Not ready to learn that sea urchin. That leads to particularly adverse consequences for dyslexic people because it shifts them from their stronger to their weaker learning systems. But actually, it's a huge issue for anyone. Stress is the assassin of cognitive function. So if you're too stressed, you can't do anything. This is a study that we did with dyslexic students, and we looked at the effect of stress. So here is their performance. Uh, the effect size showing that their performance is actually worse than the control students. So the further down the um, bar chart it goes, the bigger the difference is. There's reading, rapid name speed, form, performing a jigsaw, a motor sequence, picture memory, a declarative strength. Okay, so we get them to put their hands in a bucket of very, very cold water. That wasn't me that did this, it was Rod. I'm not that cruel. And it doesn't affect their performance very much. But look what it does to their strength, their declarative memory. It completely wipes that out. And so it's expected, under no stress, they showed clear weaknesses in all those other aspects, but strengths in the um, predicted by the procedural declarative framework, they performed significantly better on declarative memory. But under stress conditions, we simply wiped that out. Now, just think about examinations. How often do we stress our dyslexic students with examinations? We're going to wipe out all of their learning. 
So we have a toxic cycle here, a terrible danger that failure leads to learned helplessness, which inhibits learning, but may also fester, generalises to other aspects of the school environment. So we get the very thought of school triggering feelings of rage and helplessness. Um, and the only solution is either freeze or actions such as disruption, being the class clown is a good one, or truancy, simply just not going. And the danger is that a dyslexic child can be brainwashed, so the printed word simply triggers those feelings of learned helplessness or rage, from which there's no escape. It, in fact, took me many years to get my husband, David, to even begin to think of reading a book. I actually read him three chapters of a book and then left him dangling. Um, and you did actually engage with it in the end, but you haven't read many books since, have you? I didn't know he was dyslexic. I wasn't being cruel. I thought he was being lazy. So, failing to learn, learning to fail. At five years, they're not reading ready, and not classroom ready in terms of those executive functions. The reading instruction itself places impossible demands on their fragile executive function skills, and those resulting failures lead to toxic experiences, leads to chronic stress, prevents them from learning, and it may be associated with helpless anger. As a young boy of five, our son said, they hold up pieces of paper. Everyone knows what it says, and I don't, so I must be stupid. These were flashcards in those days. And of course, he wasn't street stupid. He was extremely, extremely intelligent. Some individuals, that will lead to truancy, delinquency, offending, in others to a range of displacement activities, in others to complete disengagement. For Matt, it was, he continued to engage, but he developed a tremendous stutter. Children have learned to fail, and we may in fact have created that learning disability. We start with a learning difference, we put impossible demands on them, and the triangle hypothesis suggests that the risk compounded by the stress from the learning environment actually can create a learning disability, not just a difference. So what can we do? How can we make sure that those children fly? We need executive function in place, uh, support very early on, before the child even starts school, and possibly even delaying formal reading instruction. Lots of literacy, but not reading instruction. And then we may find that the child flies and they develop reading success. And they can then reach their higher potential. So we've got some positive effects, some studies. The Welsh studies, which I've talked about before, we have over a thousand children now going through uh, early intervention at five. 89.7% no longer show risk after screening and 12 weeks of multisensory support, three hours weekly with games. The DAS, fantastic studies that Carl I and Shakti have done. Um, 294 kindergartners improved in early literacy skills. And the feedback from both parents and teachers suggested that they were beginning to develop resilience. And again, that is key. Both those approaches emphasize the development of executive function to support problems in learning. Here's a study from New Zealand where they actually have a Steiner school which doesn't start teaching the children to read until they're seven. And when they're eight, of course, they lag behind. But by the time they get to 11, in fact, they're uh, making strong improvements. And the interesting thing is that uh, it works for all the different levels, but the greatest impact is for the children with the greatest difficulties. So those, I think, are the ones at the top. OK. So, in fact, you can see that the ones who started later actually overtook the children who started earlier in the low achievers. The moderate achievers, the success was, 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 was better if they started late, and the high achievers were going to do it anyway, so it didn't really matter. So here we have the natural learning spiral. It's social, immersive, playful, personal, experiential, repetitive. It's progressive, and it has the teacher as mediator. And here, I think very much of Carly at the DAS, because she, to me, is the natural embodiment of that approach. I never teach my pupils. I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn. And that was Einstein. 
So, conclusions. Comorbidity, executive function, stress and resilience. It's important to look beyond reading, even beyond dyslexia, because many learning difficulties appear to show developmental delay. Failure and anxiety are enough to cause chronic stress that can be seen as responsible for the subsequent learning disorder. So we have the triangle hypothesis. We have the child, his dyslexia, his weakness, his strengths as the peak of the, of the triangle, and his learning environment, including both home and school. Early intervention for classroom readiness skills added delayed forming formal reading instruction and a move away from things like rote learning, very damaging rote learning, reduced the incidence of risk of failure and allowed the development of resilience in dyslexia. So here I have a few key references, um, particularly to the book Positive Dyslexia from my colleague Rod Nicholson. It's an iBook, so if you don't fancy reading, Rod will read it to you, and that will explain all of our theories. So thank you very much. I think it's key that we support the children very, very early, and we can actually cut into that whole cycle of failure. So I told you yesterday, and I told you today, that our son has a terrible stutter. He no longer has that stutter. He now has a degree in politics, and he's the uh, coordinator for the whole of the north of England for the campaign for nuclear disarmament against Trident, which is our nuclear uh, submarine. So he is living his dream. So this is what we want for our children with dyslexia. Thank you very much.